Welcome to Long Light Photographs by David Lieb. Um, today's the official opening day. This is the artist David Lieb, and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome him here. Thank you. And to thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I will say that um, we were able to have David and his partner Jack Potter here for, for two weeks, so they have participated fully in the installation of this exhibition, and that has been one of the great pleasures of this project for I me. Have, I have to say it's been one of my great pleasures, too. It's been an amazing experience working with you, and, 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 and it's just been unbelievable. Thank you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I promise I'm not going to read all afternoon, but I did. I wanted to just kick us off um, with some thoughts that I've put together on paper. Uh, I first encountered David's photography a decade ago, and I was amazed uh, then by its beauty and its scope, and I was also attracted by its unique qualities. David has worked mostly outside of contemporary art trends since the beginning of his career. As a curator, I found this challenging because there wasn't a discourse or a movement, things that curators like, um, that could easily absorb his pictures. There wasn't a sort of a, a category of, of contemporary art in place that I could just put these pictures into. David's photographs are personal, yet also collaborative. They are intuitive and highly aesthetic, yet they're also engaged with the world and many of its problems. I learned over time that much of what I love about David's work stems from his profound openness about himself and his life, which extends to his receptivity toward others um, and bringing them into his work. His photographs of the writer and porn star, Scott O'Hara, are a good example, and those are the photographs that are on view on the wall behind me around on the other side. David photographed Scott four times over a period of seven years, and Scott would often perform sexually before his camera. These photographs are about sex, to be sure, but more importantly for me, they form a loving and nuanced portrait of Scott, who became David's friend. Although David's work doesn't fit neatly onto any map of contemporary art that I'm aware of, it is part of a larger trend that has long interested me. Many gay and lesbian artists in the 1970s and 80s turn to photography as their medium of choice. That is a story that hasn't fully been told. It's still unfolding um, and waiting to be told in its entirety. Um, and there are many voices contributing to the story, um, which I'm very happy about. This exhibition is just one iteration. But one of my goals for this exhibition, um, the most important one, was, was to give David a proper survey of what I think is a really um, tremendous and moving body of work but also to, to make a contribution to our understanding of queer art in, in those crucial decades of the 1970s and 80s, um, which, which we are still, historians and curators and artists are still getting all the word out about that, and, and David's work is a really valuable contribution to that. So that's why I'm here today. Um, and David and I, we planned a little bit, and we want this to be a pretty natural conversation um, and you're going to hear less from me at this point and more from David. Okay. So David, um, when you and I first started talking about your work, lo, those many years ago, I was excited because I'm, I studied early photography when I was in school, and I, I love 19th century photography, the, the, the really early stuff. And I was excited by the fact that David made pinhole photographs, photograms, and then light drawings, all in the 1970s. And then you also decided to hand color some of those, um, those prints. And I thought that you had, you had um, done all of those things to sort of engage in a, in a methodical exploration of early photographic processes. And I wanted to know why, right? So I came with my curator question. And you gently told me that I was completely and utterly wrong. Um, <laughs> very gently did you explain that. Um, but I was wrong, and, uh, and I'm glad I know that now. And so I just thought I would ask you 
to talk about what drew you to these, these really basic sort of elementary approaches to making photography. Much of, of all three of those kinds of pictures I described are on view in the first part of the show and they carry over into, into this, this second part as well. Well, you know, I was aware of that 19th century work. Uh, and, um, but, uh, and I liked much of it, but uh, what really drew me to it was, was that it was low tech and elementary. And I think I felt that certain, it, working in those processes, I felt a, a more direct, con um, a more direct contact with, with the work. It was more like handwork. Like more like drawing to me. I, the machine wasn't between so much, I didn't feel so much there was a machine between me and the product that I was producing, at the end, the end product. So that was a big draw. Uh, the other was just the fact that, um, the, that I, well, for example, building the pinhole camera, I, I could create a camera that created an image format that, that, that the camera didn't dictate, that I made myself and chose myself. Um, and I found that very exciting. Uh, I, 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 and I, and I like the, the challenges and surprises that came with uh, working that way. For example, with a pinhole camera, you were kind of forced to do long exposures and uh, that was something that, you know, was like, well, now how do I solve this problem and what, uh, what advantages will this give in making a, an image? Uh, you know, I could, found I could walk around and be in the picture myself. Uh, something probably I wouldn't have done if I had just been working with my, you know, Olympus camera. Uh, and um, so, so, the, the, so there was that kind of excitement and um, invention and um, of, of work of working uh, that way. With the hand coloring, it, it was a little different. Um, I, 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 used, I photographed a lot of slide with a lot of slide film, uh, particularly right after I got out of school, and um, I, I was I didn't know how to make prints with it. I couldn't afford the expensive dye transfer processes. I wasn't very enamored with the C prints, which are the kind of prints that you get from the drugstore. And uh, I, I just didn't like, I didn't like the surface of the paper. I didn't like the, I didn't like the fact that I couldn't manipulate it. I didn't like, like, or that it was just very limited manipulation. Uh, I didn't like the process of working in, the, in a color dark room on it. So uh, when, uh, but I really was interested in color. I loved color. I wanted to color in my work. And uh, when I saw the, uh, w walking through a camera store in New York and this little box caught my eye and it was like, wow, maybe this is a solution. And I, I bought it and started experimenting and I loved it. And I, and I, and I started, and then I started collecting up uh, old postcards that were hand colored uh, in order to teach myself kind of how to use it. So there was that influence sort of crept into the work, which I think is maybe evident in some of the work. Uh, and um, and, and um, the light drawings were different though. I, I don't know if that's really a 19th century process, light drawings. Yeah. No, it's you not. Know, it's not. Uh, and, but it's a hand process. It's, a, it's another process where the machine isn't dictating exactly what's going to be on the piece of paper. It's my hand, you know, drawing. So, uh, so there was that. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, at, at, the at that time too, ni ni around 1970, just before, just after, I, if it, I as a student, I, I had this sense that I wanted to Photography had very um, definite rules, you know, of um, how you edited, how you made a print. There were, there were, it, was kind of, it was kind of, I found it a little restricting. And I looked 
I, I grew up in New York City and spent a lot of time going to museums and galleries through high school. And I, I, had, a, 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 I had this sense that I wanted to bring more of, 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 of not just the aesthetic, but the process of painting and printmaking and drawing into photography. And all these processes were a way of doing that, of, of trying to blend the two or the various mediums. So that was another big attraction to me for all of these processes. There's a great quote in one of your early interviews where you say that instead of the decisive moment, your, your pictures became the decisive 20 minutes. Yes. <laughs> well, that might be the story of my life. <laughs> but, and you also have talked about the photographs being events rather than pictures or snapshots, right? So that it's That's a, true. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extended exchange, often with the subject. Yes. And, and, and in a way, uh, that was kind of a discovery that came out of working with these processes rather than an intentional um, uh, um, idea that uh, I, I found the processes for. I mean, I let the process, I, I let the work, I, I, let, I let the work teach me. I let, I let the process teach me things uh, rather than trying to impose some idea on what, what the result would be. I think that's a really important aspect of your work. You often talk about um, how intuitive your, your working methods are and, and um, the fact that you, know, you really believe in a visual language that's, that's separate from, from spoken language or written ideas or arguments and that the, you, know, you, you really do learn about, you say that you learn about your work from making it, right? Yes, and I, and I often uh, don't understand it till after it's made, uh, you know, which um, at first made me very nervous, but I, I learned to trust it after a while. But although still, I, uh, when I start out uh, on a new project, it's often, is anything really happening here that's any good or any interest that's interesting? But, you know, I have to trust that eventually something is going to happen. And uh, it usually does, uh, but uh, of course not always. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about your photograms? Because the, um, that's a very simple process, but you, you made it complicated with the way that you, you, you put your pictures together. Uh, uh, well, yes, I tend to do that also, yes. Uh, um, well, I, I, I might say how I started to do them, which was kind of serendipitous or accidental. I, I was teaching some basic photography courses uh, at uh, Philadelphia College of Art, which is now uh, University of the Arts. And uh, I was teaching an evening class, uh, a basic beginning evening class. And um, I, traditionally, the way those classes are taught, you, you, you teach people what photography is, how the enlarger works, and one of the ways to do that is have them make photograms. They just put an object on a, on a piece of sensitive paper, you turn on the light, it makes a shadow, uh, and you develop the paper and you get a, a white spot where the, sh where the object was. Uh, it's, it's sort of the most basic ph photographic way to work, or make a most basic way to make a photograph. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, uh, uh, a bathing suit mark on your body. It's the same thing. That's also a photogram. Uh, uh, and um, so, I, I, so I had the students doing that, and I really got interested in what they were doing. And so I assigned them to do it again another week. And, uh, and uh, one of the students got very annoyed with me and said, when are we going to make real photographs? And... Uh, and did you ever make photograms? And I thought, no, you know, I didn't actually ever make a photogram. Somehow I had missed that in my education. So I, it sort of became a challenge, and I set about making photograms, and it was hard. It was not as easy as I thought to get anything that I found um, very interesting or very satisfying. So I worked on it a long time, and it, it, it really took me years before I made these photograms that you see on the wall here. Uh, and again, I didn't set out, 
I didn't know what they would be about before I made them, but you know, then looking at them, they seemed to be about, um, I mean, I, I was living in a tiny apartment in the city, uh, uh, and uh, my life was rather tiny, uh, you know, and I, I, not very expansive, I didn't have a lot of friends. I was still, when I started these, I was still pretty much in the closet, uh, and um, although that changed as I started to make them, I, I guess. But um, so I, I, I wanted a more expansive outlook. I wanted more, uh, bigger space to work in. So I kind of invented these landscapes and gardens, which were things I actually never photographed with a camera at that point. Not till many, many years later did I photograph gardens. And, or, and to this day, I really don't photograph landscapes. So you know, I was kind of a way of inventing that. Uh, and uh, it was just happened. <laughs> and where did you exhibit your work in the early days? Ah, well, um, I, 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 that, it was not easy to find places to exhibit. I was very fortunate uh, that uh, Paul Cava, who... Um, had a very unique gallery in Philadelphia, uh, brought in a lot of interest. There were very few galleries in Philadelphia at that time, and very few contemporary shows. I don't think the, um, the, uh, the contemporary uh, gallery in, at Penn even existed at that time. So you really had to go to New York to see anything interesting. And uh, Paul Cava, um, oh, I guess it was about my age, opened a little gallery on Spruce Street and started showing interesting people, including, I mean, he showed paintings and uh, as well as photography, which also was kind of special then. And I really liked the idea of being with a gallery that showed both paintings and photography, considering how I felt about photography. And um, so he really kind of believed in my work right from the beginning and supported me through times that I don't know if I would have survived as an artist if I didn't have that kind of support. Because, you know, it gets, if, without recognition, without getting money, it's pretty hard to keep going uh, often. And uh, to have that kind of backing and support and friendship was just really special. Mm -hmm. And I think he, he probably um, played that role for more people than me. Yeah, no, and, and Paul's here with us today, so that's also great. But you know, pa Paul is 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 known in the in the art community here for for championing certain artists, and also for always having been very open minded. And I, I'm wondering if you encountered homophobia or just a resistance to showing you know the, your more obviously gay work. Well, certainly not from Paul. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, although uh, he's not. Gay. He was, you know, he was. He was. He was. Uh, uh, um, he, you know, he. he, he what? You what? <laughs> he said what was that? <laughs> A little gay. You, you, I was going to say you. And we're all the better for it, you, Paul. You, you, I w what I think I wanted to say was you're gay in all ways except sexually. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, so, uh, no, so it, it was, you know, th there was no issue there at all. But, you know, Philadelphia, and, and I know Paul has dealt with this over the years, Philadelphia is a conservative town in many ways. Oh, and it was so, a lot more then. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so, that, so it was really a breath, breath of fresh air. I mean, it was, things were pretty stodgy in this building, particularly when it came to photography. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was... Um, but uh, where were we? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, this actually leads me to a question, um, a new question. Um, but the, of course, ICA did, did, which is the great contemporary art space at Penn, did um, evolve over the 70s and 80s. And they originated the famous Robert Maplethorpe show in 1989. I think it was in 89, um, which then traveled and, and caused a ruckus around the country. But Philadelphia, I have to say, I just said it was conservative, but Philadelphia was very welcoming and tolerant of that show when it was here. Perhaps nobody noticed. 
<laughs> but do you do you remember that show? I mean, I I, I know you went to see it. Uh, yes. So I, how did it? What was your response? Did you know well, about the work already? I, I didn't know his work already, and I, and I remember it well because, and and in fact, I recently watching a, a, a PBS uh, special on him, I was very surprised to see myself there, uh, looking at uh, at the X portfolio, uh, and uh, so I I'm sure I was there. It's not a false memory, uh, but. Um, yeah, I, I knew his work by that time. I had got, means I went up to New York frequently. Uh, so, um, so what do you want me to say? How, well, what I know, thought of his many work? Many people or? have asked me about Maplethorpe when they when they see your uh, work, and I think your work is is very very different from his, even when you when you work with the erotic male nude body. Uh -huh. But I, you know, well, I'm just curious about what your re reaction was to his work when you saw it and what you think of it now. Well, it, I, I thought it was a lot about style at the time. I was very uh, conscious that he was very about style, which I, I didn't think I was. So there was that sort of self-consciousness about style. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, um, I was doing male nude work at the same time he was. And, yeah. and so I, it wasn't that like, oh, it's okay to I saw his work and said, oh, it's okay to do that. I mm -hmm. was already doing that. Uh, it just nobody saw it like they saw his work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working with, uh, I was working with a different people. I mean, you know, he was consciously going out and looking for, uh, you know, pe uh, people with um, unusual or, uh, or or radical uh, ways of looking, or and so on. And I just was dealing with people that I mean, like I like all my work. I was dealing with what naturally was part of my life, uh, and uh, I wasn't going out and searching out um, people who I thought would make uh, startling or interesting photographs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if they happened to stumble into my life, of course I photographed them, but uh, it was because they were a part of what was happening with me. So my inspiration for photography always came from my life and from myself. Uh, and um, not that I was trying to tell the story of my life in a sort of mundane way, but, the, but that, became, that was the inspiration, was, 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 was that through what was happening to me. And what was happening to me was not what was happening to Maplethorpe, that was for sure. So uh, that was very different. Good. I mean, I, I met, were you excited that, that the exhibition actually happened though? I mean, it must oh, be. Oh yeah, that was, I mean, you know, to see that, 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 to see openly gay work was very exciting, certainly. I mean, the, you know, there were, there were people like, um, Minor White and Dwayne Michaels and people we think of now as uh, gay photographers. But at the time I first saw that work and when I was in school and uh, even considerably after school, uh, you know, we kind of lo looked and we said, yeah, well, probably, but we didn't know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, was and, and it was frustrating and annoying. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'd always, I mean, from an early period I had sort of resolved to just be open in my work and uh, and then uh, and and let people know that uh, I was gay and that the work came from that experience and 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 then to see these people where that wasn't the case was was frustrating to mm -hmm, me and mm -hmm. and yeah so we are seated in front of um, four of your, your scribble series. They might be hard to see because we're sitting in front of them, but there's another beautiful big print right there, scribble number 23. Um, do you want to talk about that series a little bit? I mean, it kind of relates to, to where we've been. Sure. Uh, that, well, th that series, unlike, um, well, of course, you can consider them part of the light drawing series, I guess, but uh, that series, really as a unique closed series, it, it was a little different from some of the other species. It's really 
it was done over a very short period of time. Most of my series can, took maybe years and I would come back to it and so on. Uh, and um, I was at the time doing, um, when it came about, I was doing uh, still lives without light drawing. I had them, I would set up still lives in my um, living room and uh, light them and photograph them. And then I got the idea to use light drawing with them to outline them the way I had outlined bodies and so on. And uh, I was doing that. And um, at the time that was going on, a, 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 former, uh, an, a former lover and friend of mine, still friend, good friend of mine, was uh, dying of AIDS. He was, I guess, the per first person I knew who was uh, really infected and, and, and very sick. And, um, you know, it was on my mind all the time. And um, so, uh, I, and so I kept myself busy working, which is what I always do. Uh, and uh, so I, I, would, I, would, I would leave school or whatever chores I was doing. I'd come home, I'd stop at uh, one of these um, flower carts and buy a bunch of flowers and set them up and then do my light drawings. And then one day I came, I, I forgot to do that, and I finished dinner and I thought, oh, it's too late to go get flowers. What, I mean, I was very annoyed. What am I gonna do with myself that evening? I, you know. And then it occurred to me, well, I don't need the flowers. I'll just go out there and do the drawing. And, uh, and I did that that evening, and then I looked at the contact prints, and I went, wow, this is terrific. Why didn't I think of this before? Why wasn't I doing this all along? And, and that's what I then did rather intensely for, I don't know, a few months, I guess. Uh, and um, then uh, my friend Barry died, and uh, I kind of stopped doing them. I don't know, it wasn't a conscious decision, but it just, the process stopped and uh, I looked at the pictures, I, 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 pr I printed up some of the pictures shortly after that and uh, I thought, well, these are fun and, and, and kind of frivolous and this is epidemic raging and I'm a gay photographer and I should be doing something about this and, talking about this and being serious and, and uh, speaking to this issue. And these fun little frivolous pictures are not doing it. So I stuck them in a box and uh, put it away and stopped thinking and said, I'm never going to print these <laughs> or show these. And, uh, and then some months went by and I, I thought I wasn't doing much and I thought, well, let me get these pictures out. And I pinned them up on a wall and people started dropping by the studio and would make comments and so on. And, and one day, uh, a woman who worked in um, a gallery, it wasn't Paul's at this time, he was between galleries, he was building his new gallery and he had closed his old one. And um, she stopped by and she had just lost uh, her son, her college age son who was, he was in college at Penn. He was a hemophiliac and he had just died of AIDS. And um, she came in and she said, oh, th these, are, uh, these are funeral urns and spirits of the dead. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I still don't really think of them as funeral urns, but I think of them more as, as bodies or something. But I mean, that's the way she saw them. And after that I thought, Oh, of course, that's what I was doing. These are, these are spirits of, you know. And, and then I got really excited and I got all the negatives out and started printing like crazy and I started hand coloring them. And this is part of the series that you see here. That's a, that's a great example of your intuitive working methods, right? Where yeah. You, you sort of let the work happen and then you, and, and, you and sort an, it out. And after an example that. of not trusting myself, at, you know, right. also. So um, around the corner is a, a new series of prints you made, um, the DC-87 prints, also made in 1987, but you never showed them or printed them 
until we were getting ready for this show. So it was exciting for me that you, you did print them and you said we could put them in. Do you want to talk about that at all? I mean, I, I just always have in mind they were made the same year as the scribbles, and it, it's, it's actually it's the only documentary project by you in the show where you, you went to the March on Washington that year, the Gay and Lesbian March, and, and photographed it. Well, I've I always had a, a love of uh, street photography, documentary photography. I mean, that was my... I mean, that's what probably drew me into photography, and uh, it was sort of my roots. And, you know, I, I think there's maybe a story, it's even maybe in the book, if I'm remembering right, about uh, memorizing Robert Frank's Americas when I, Americans when I was in uh, high school. Like, I, I could tell you every picture and what, which picture came first and second and third and so on. Uh, I practically slept with that book under my pillow. Uh, Maybe I even did, I don't know, or next to my pillow anyway. So, uh, 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 so and, and I would go to um, events, you know, uh, with friends, some of which are sitting right here. We would go down to Washington and uh, photograph marches uh, during the Vietnam era, you know, anti-Vietnam War era. And um, I just, you know, I love doing it. And um, so when the march came along and I heard about it, I thought, well, you know, this is, and it was at a time politically and so on where it, there was a lot, I mean, I won't go into the history here, but it was, I felt very important that I go to the march. So, um, I, 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 but I was busy, I guess, doing the Scribble series, which I wouldn't have remembered if you hadn't told me, but uh, I, was, I was busy doing other things. And, um, a couple of days or the day before the march, I, 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 um, I thought, well, am I gonna bring my camera? And I thought, no, it'd just be heavy and I'd be hauling it around. And then I thought, no, this is ridiculous. I have to bring my camera. I can't go without my camera. And I rushed off before five o'clock to get some film before the camera store closed. And I got there and I sort of made this last minute decision to buy this recording film, which was a film used for police surveillance photography, a very fast film. And, uh, but it was very grainy film. And uh, because I'd always, w I'd been wanting to experiment with this film for years and I thought, oh, here's the opportunity to do that. And, uh, and I made the pictures and I, I developed them. And, I, and my idea was to blow them up as in, into big prints so they could see all the grain. And I got back, and I, I hadn't done any preparation or figured out how I was going to develop this stuff. And, and the grain came out pretty rough, and the pictures didn't look good big at all. And uh, I got, it was pretty hard to uh, print them in the way that I really wanted them to look. You know, they weren't, they weren't coming up to my standards. So I just put the whole thing away. But... The picture stuck with me because I really, I don't know, it was something that, it was a fabulous experience going to this march, the, um, the energy. The, it was a very low time, the AIDS was coming on, there was stuff happening in the Supreme Court, uh, and there were also a lot of new um, gay groups forming all over that we'd read about and hear about. And suddenly we got, all these people came to Washington all at once and you saw, you, you saw all these groups that you had just read about. And there was just kind of an infectious energy and excitement that was going on. And I just loved these pictures. So I, I had some little sort of drugstore sized prints made and I put them in a, in a photo album. And that's where they sat until Peter saw them. And he loved them too. And, I, and he said, I, I, let's put these in the show. Let's put these in the book. And I said, not like this, not these prints. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, uh, made, digital, I made digital um, files from the negatives and I worked on printing them for six months. It took me six months to get them to a way that I liked them, that I was satisfied with them. And this is part of the result here. It's a, it's a larger group of pictures. Yeah, it's six, 60 pictures, I think. Is in, that in it? In the whole yeah. portfolio. Yeah. 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 And that, that also, I think, another interesting to me and way of 
that you work is that you when, you, when you have a picture that you like, whenever you've made it, you often return to the picture to make new prints. And, 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 and the prints you make are very different every time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I find it boring just to make what I did before, so I, I try to reinterpret it and rethink it. And we also, there are some examples at the beginning of the show of, of your, your color film work, because even though you didn't like color film, you did make some pictures with it, and also you didn't, you didn't print those until the, the past five or six years, I think. Well, you're talking about the pinhole pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some of those, uh, the, the four in the corner there, are, uh, were made on ectochrome film. And I never could figure out what to do. You couldn't enlarge it because they wouldn't fit. They were foot long, the negatives. And so there was no enlarger that I could fit them into. And uh, so, uh, and then there wasn't really a process that I could afford to make color prints of them. Uh, and um, so they just sat for until I learned how to use the computer and, you know, and, and then it, just it hit me one day, well, I can finally make the prints I always wanted to make 45 years ago or whenever it was. And, um, and I did, and it was, it was a couple, of, I think it was a couple of years, was it? Do you remember, Jack, how long I worked on those things? It was a long haul. It was a long haul. <laughs> it was, it was, and it got, at the end it was pretty, getting pretty, uh, pretty gruesome. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I, it was thrilling to be able to, because I remembered how I thought about them back then and how I really wanted them to look, and then to be able to, all these years later, to then see them how I had always dreamed of them being was, was, was pretty exciting to me. And I was able to enlarge them also, that was the other thing that I was able to do when I made them digital. I mean, I just love digital photography. Uh, very different from the, um, from the low-tech uh, way that I guess I started out making pictures. Right. And, and, and few photographers of your generation have made that shift with as much passion and happiness as you <laughs> have. So that's, <laughs> I got the signal that we're gonna um, open this conversation up now. So we're happy to um, take questions from the audience and I'll just ask people to be patient while we get a, 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 a mic to you. So David, I would like to uh, ask you a little bit, have you respond to your most recent work over the last five years? I noticed that there's a relationship formally between that work and some of the early photograms that you did. And you seem, almost seem like you're seen photogrammatically without the process. Well, well those pictures, the, the, the last group, which I call Shadow Life, pictures uh, in, that, in that corner over there, the dark corner, the dark wall. Um, they're all pictures of shadows. Well, they're all photographs of shadows. And, and I started out making them just of the shadow, not allowing any of the object that was creating the shadow to be in the picture. And uh, after a few years, I started re um, relaxing my standards a little bit and allowing uh, things to creep in. And, and even now, I'm sometimes deliberately putting an object right in the middle of the picture now. But uh, they started out as shadows. And of course, photograms are shadows. They're just uh, they're shadows that are made very close to the photographic surface. Where this, I'm doing it. So, so I sometimes think of these pictures as photograms made with the camera. Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm always, I think I've always done this as I've referenced my own work for inspiration uh, and then tried to take it to a new step or a new level. Hi, David, my name is Chris. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your light drawing process because as I, as I was looking at the photographs, it struck me how much is going on in one photograph, so I'm imagining You've got a, a live model sitting there for an extended period of time. Yes. You're doing the drawing with your hand, and I would imagine you have to time that to the shutter speed and all that. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, it's not, it's not so precise. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, by the seat of your pants going on there. Uh, uh, 
you know, um, and some of them could be, could go up to 40 minutes. And some were, might be only five minutes or even a minute or so. Uh, but, um, I mean, you know, you open the camera, you take the light, and I mean, a, a lot of them have started out by just, by just outlining people. I just take the light and, you know, outline people, which could be very sensual sometimes. Uh, and, uh, but you also had to keep in mind what the camera was seeing because I, you weren't, because I was standing next to the model, not in the models. I wasn't looking through the model's eyes. So I, sometimes the, the light would move to a place where the camera couldn't see it. But it was hard to know that standing next to the model and not in the model's place. Uh, so uh, accidents happened. And sometimes they were fabulous and terrific and they made the picture. And sometimes they ruined the picture. Uh, so, uh, you know, there was a certain amount of like every, like for every five or ten I made, one was great and the rest were like, ugh. <laughs> yeah. So the, well, so the, yes, so there was a certain amount of that, and um, you know, with the with the um, scribbles, again, I I wouldn't plan them out, but I I kind of get a very very brief kind of idea that I was going to go, I was going to where I was going to start, if I was going to do a straight line or a curved line, and I try not to get it too worked out in my head, and then I open the camera, run out there, and just try to do it without thinking about it much, with my mind clear. And, uh, and then I would look at the contact sheet and I'd see what worked. And then the next day I'd go back and, say, and pick out the ones that seemed to work better and start there instead of where I had started the night before. And I might do that over a succession of days or weeks until they started to develop and I started to get ones that were um, more satisfactory to me. Hi, David. Uh, I, I wondered uh, if you could s say a few things. Pardon? Where, where are we? Oh, oh, Tom, over there. Okay. I just wondered if you could say a few things about uh, the two Barbers in your life, Barbara Blondeau and Barbara Crane and their influence. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, well, uh, Barbara Blondeau was a teacher of mine at uh, Philadelphia College of Art. Um, she died in 1974 at the age of 35 from breast cancer. Uh, and um, uh, she was the one who gave me the assignment to make uh, pinhole pictures. Uh, and um, she, 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 I, I liked her very much. She was a very quiet person, uh, and, but very supportive. She was just a wonderful person to be with, and I, I really came to really love her and, uh, and value her support. And the little bit of work I was able to see, I really, uh, I, I really enjoyed. Uh, and um, after I graduated, we, we stayed friends. Uh, in part, I really got to know her because of Tom, who had just asked, Tom Perret, who had just asked this question, because he would have these, um, dinners uh, for the community at his house uh, and barbecues and so on. And where a lot of us in the photo community in Philadelphia at that time, in the um, 60s and 70s and even into the 80s, uh, uh, really got to know each other in a way that I think none of us would have without that, that w what he did. Because there weren't a lot of people uh, sort of bringing about that kind of social connection. Uh, and um, I, I kind of thought that she was, uh, was a gay woman, uh, but I didn't know. She was, in, she was very closeted. And, but, and, and I, I, I sort of thought, well, I sure hope she is. Uh, because, you know, uh, and... Um, and just before uh, she, she died, um, when uh, she was, perhaps it was when she was even in the hospital for the final time, um, I found out that she was gay and she found out that I was gay. Um, 
and um, but we never talked about it. And uh, although I seen her afterwards when we both knew, uh, knew, and it just was very sad for me that we were never able to talk about that. Uh, and I and and eventually I, I learned more about her private life, and uh, and 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 I learned how much more difficult her illness and her death was because she was in the closet. And that was very sad for me and very, um, you know, made a big impression and a big influence on me. And I kind of, at that, that was really when I resolved that I was going to be really out uh, in, in my work and in my teaching. And, uh, I, and, and right after that, I started to come out to all my classes at uh, Philadelphia College of Art. And I think I, I, I can't be sure about this, but I think I was the only one ever doing that at the time. Uh, I devised this way of doing it where I, would, um, where I would show slides of my work. So it could be in a dark room and I was in behind the class instead of in front of the class. And I would show the work and then talk about it. And in the course of talking about it, I would talk about being gay or whatever. And um, so that, that made it a, a huge, that was a huge influence on me. And then uh, after she died, um, a number of people, Ron Walker, uh, and who I believe is here, and um, Joan Redman and myself, um, put together a show and a book of her work. Uh, and uh, the, sh the show was at the school, and, w and there was a catalog out, which you can sometimes still get on the internet uh, if you're lucky. They sometimes come up. And but I, I got the opportunity to s really be intimate with her work, uh, to look through every picture, sh you know, that she ever made that existed, and uh, to think about it and sort it out. And and the work was really good. It's re it's really wonderful work for. You know, somebody who only lived to 35. And, and we, we have three or four of them in, in, in the book, in your new book. Yes. That we reproduced. Yeah, there are a few reproduced in my book. And the museum has acquired some of her work recently, so which is wonderful. Uh, and um, so that, just having that intimate connection with the work was also a big influence, I think, on me. Uh, and then the other barber you wanted me to say about the other barber is uh, Barbara Crane, uh, who is a Chicago photographer, uh, quite well known uh, in her 90s now, or I guess 90, 91. Uh, she's about to become, she's, she's exactly um, 20 years older than me, so she's uh, uh, by, by a few days, so, so she's 90. And um, she came to uh, Philadelphia College of Art for a semester. And I had just moved into my house on 15th Street, and I had an apartment that was empty, and she lived there. And the rest of the building, the other apartment, there were three apartments, and the other one was empty. So we kind of shared the building, and she shared my dark room, and we became really good friends really fast. Uh, it was like instant. Like it, it, it took about five or ten minutes, and we knew instantly we were com you know, just completely happy with each other. And uh, we stayed good friends till this day. And uh, she also, I mean, I'll, she also came out of that uh, Institute of Design background where many of my, where all of my teachers really at uh, Philadelphia College of Art, Tom Perrette, Barbara uh, Blondeau, uh, and Ray Metzger all came from that background. And uh, Barbara Crane also came from that background. So there was that you know, reinforcement of that influence. And, and, and I know she gave me a lot of comment. We traveled together. She, she just, uh, just watching the way she interacted with the art world and so on. It was, and it was, it was just, and, and she taught me a lot. The other thing she taught me a lot about, it was uh, the position of women uh, in photography, um, which was not a lot of people at that time were in, in the, um, the photo art community, uh, not a lot of women. And uh, as a teacher, she would come home uh, and, we, and we would have dinner together most nights and she would spill like what happened uh, at, her, at her day at work. 
and many, uh, she put, and many of the stories were about uh, women students coming to her and just letting loose about how they couldn't deal with these men and how it was difficult and, uh, and the problems and, and some saying, I really want to come into the photography department, but I can't because of the people who are teaching there and I don't feel comfortable. And uh, so that was a real eye-opener to me and I connected very much with, I think, the gay experience was in a, in a way of being able to be come out in that environment. So I, it was that kind of bond between us also. We'll move on to the next question. Yeah. Okay. We'll move on to the next question, but I, I just wanted to observe that, that the really experimental nature of that Institute of Design group in Chicago, the, 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 the experimental approach to photography, I think is an important um, influence on your work. I mean, Barbara Blondeau and Ray Metzger the way you tell it, and others have told it, they they encouraged any and every kind of experimentation in the darkroom and at the printing stage, and that really liberated you in a way, I think, to 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 make pictures in a lot of different oh, forms. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think I was inclined that way also, and also my um, grade school education was kind of geared that way also, uh, and. Um, and it was, it just felt right. It was a natural fit for me. I just, I was at, I, I came home, I was at home. I mean, I felt I had come home in, when I was in that environment. There was one question. Yeah, I was going to mention Ray Metzger too and uh. his playful aspect and how much did that influence you? Because I remember looking at contact sheets with him and him finding little things that were going on, and you know, I, I, oh, well, I'd just like to add to that. <laughs> well, Ray had a tremendous influence on me, tremendous. I mean, he was a fabulous teacher. Uh, I, I don't know, he, he, there was, I, I've never had a teaching experience like that, of course. But uh, he, you know, he had an intensity about him, a playfulness about him. He was, he was kind of a stern, um, fatherly kind of man in a way sometimes, but then he was also incredibly playful, incredibly inventive, uh, incredibly inspiring, and uh, uh, it, was, it was just a, a, a once in a lifetime, a fabulous experience uh, studying with him. I think we have one more question. David, uh, when you were doing the light drawings, there's certainly an aspect of performance art about the actual making of it. And when you started, I think performance art was kind of beginning to get a kind of recognition. That's true. Did this play any role in your doing this? Were you aware of it? Or was it just a way to get a print? I think it was a way to get a print. I mean, it was very, it was very, it was a performance. It was a performance for me. I mean, it was very private or performance for two people. It was, when I was working with the model, it was a very intimate, private thing, and when I was working by myself, it was a very solitary kind of thing. So in that way, it was not a performance art at all. But it, it, I, I, I suppose you can say, in a, in a sense, that it was expanding the, the, uh, the Cartier-Bresson uh, decisive moment into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, an, uh, an, an activity or a, or a, a performance, or a, or, 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 a, or a larger period of time. In that sense, perhaps there is a connection, and perhaps there was an influence there. Uh, it was certainly a lot of that going on at that time, and I was certainly aware of it. Okay, well, I think we're gonna wrap this up, and as I said earlier, we're, um, there are refreshments in the cafe, so if you'd like to continue the conversation, um, Come have coffee or tea, and thank you again all for being here, and thank you, David. And thank you.